My name is Andrew Duffy. I enlisted in the Iowa National Guard two days after I turned 17 years old, which was on March 21st of 2003. Um, I was enlisted as a medic, and in 2005 to 2006, I was stationed at the Abu Ghraib prison as a medic. I did det detainee operations as well as convoy operations, and I was on what they called the trauma team. Um, the first incident I would like to talk about happened on March 13th of 2006 <clears throat> involving a freshly captured detainee at the end processing center. Could you move to the next slide, please? That was the uh, sign outside the end processing center. Winning the hearts and minds of the Iraqi people one detainee at a time. I can tell you about how they won one of those minds. Uh, me and my fellow medic were making our rounds to the in-processing centers we normally did when a truckload of new captures would come in because they often come in in truckloads because they would arrest any military-aged male that was in the vicinity of an incident. So as we were going through these people and evaluating them and checking them out, one uh, young man stood out to me as being uh, particularly irate and uh, kind of out of it, almost seeming drunk. And I uh, felt it was necessary to take his blood sugar. Normal blood sugar, in, when I went through medic training, was said to be between 80 and 120. When I took his blood sugar, it was 431. I then called the officer in charge of the hospital that was at Abu Ghraib and requested that we were able to transport that detainee. And he had spoken to me in English, he could speak English very well, that he had um, been taking insulin and that he had been captured by the Iraqi forces held by them for approximately four to five days. He wasn't quite sure and that they had not given him his insulin, but supposedly it was in his personal effects. I was told twice over the phone, ordered by Captain Hogan of the 344th Cash, that I could not transport the detainee and that he needed to drink water. She also stated that he was a haji and he probably wouldn't die, but it would not matter if he died anyway. Later on that night, we went through our various calls, went to the various camps, did our stuff, did some medevacs, did a little bit of everything on the trauma team. You know, you'd medevac soldiers in and out of the hospital. And we got another call from the camps from level three, which was the camp that you were initially put into once you got into the uh, facility to kind of see how you went, you know, if you were going to be a bad apple or a good apple and put into one of the lower levels with less supervision. So me and my partner, again, this would now be in the early hours of March 14th, went back to the camp to see the same individual who is now more irate, uh, more of a intoxicated looking appearance, sweating profusely. I um, was called Captain Hogan again over the radio and the phone and again was denied permission to uh, take him to the hospital and there was little I could do and she told us to give him water and to give him an IV through a 14 gauge IV. A normal IV that would be given to a person would be an 18 to 20 gauge, 14 gauge would be about the size of a pencil lead inside the, of like a, your standard wooden pencil. So we did that, and then we uh, got off our shift. We had another shift the next day, and then on March 15th, which would have been two years ago today, me and my partner were awoken out of our beds and told that we uh, needed to go down and be interrogated by a uh, CID colonel about the death into the uh, detainee that we had seen the previous night. and. Uh, the captain, Ho the captain, Captain Hogan, said that we had never called her and that we had never tried to transport her. But what happened to the young man, he was 23 years old, was that the MPs on the morning of March 15th mistook his behavior, which was diabetic shock, as insubordination. They pepper sprayed him and then they put him into a segregation cell in the sun and that's where he spent his last few hours. And then he died in route to the hospital in uh, 
one of our ambulances. So about a few, I don't know, about three days after that, we were uh, interrogated again by a lieutenant colonel, at which time I filled out a five-page sworn statement. Um, and we were cleared of everything, and Captain Hogan was still allowed to be the officer in charge of the hospital at Abu Ghraib at night. And uh, that's my first story. I also have a second story that emphasizes the, uh, the racism and the word haji that is often used, similar to as a person a racist in this country would use the N-word or any other term or a group of people, derogatory term. I got a call that there was an unconscious detainee in one of the camps that was usually a camp that held uh, very docile prisoners, older, they weren't prisoners, they were detainees, but older detainees, people who were going to be let loose soon. And uh, as I got there, we were prepping the ambulance. My partner drove the ambulance. I prepared the, uh, the oxygen, the non-rebreather mask, and I attempted to prepare the AED except for my platoon sergeant ordered the wrong pads for the AED. So when I arrived on scene, I was unable to shock him and revive him, which they later said probably would have saved his life. We had different ambulances for the detainees than we did when we would go out on American convoys to be medical support. And they were, had the older equipment, uh, oftentimes the um, fluids and things would or prescription drugs would be expired sometimes by years. Um, anyway, the detainee was unconscious. We attempted to ventilate him on the way to the hospital. Uh, we could not ventilate because the mask was so deformed because of the heat and because it was so old. So I performed mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation on the detainee. And uh, a lot of people called them hajis and didn't like them because they were detainees, but to me, it was just an old man that could have been somebody's father, grandfather, or uncle. And I remember exactly how he looked, and I remember exactly how he felt, he, you know, dying in my hands. I revived him for about 15 seconds, at which point we were calling, my uh, assistant was calling ahead to the hospital. And uh, the hospital really wasn't responding. We got to the hospital to find them very apathetic. They, the two medics that were working the emergency room were sitting on cots sleeping. The emergency room doctor was playing Slingo, the computer game. I then had to pr continue in a hospital emergency room to perform mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation on a detainee. And I uh, later overheard many comments about how that medic made out with that haji. And, uh, you know, I was kind of isolated in that incident. And a lot of people came up to me and said, how, how the hell could you do that? And I, uh, I told them, you know, what if that was your grandfather, your father? You know, wouldn't you do the same thing? And uh, I, could, I could see where people, could you move to the next slide, please? I could see where people wouldn't want to take care of these people because at the same time I would have to treat wounded U.S. soldiers. And I remember a time that I treated a Marine that had his legs blown off and he died in our care. And then subsequently, about a half an hour later, I had to give a detainee pills for a headache. But uh, you have to realize that uh, as a medic and uh, as a professional, you need to treat these people the same. And they are human beings. And you can't treat them like uh, subhuman people. And um, I'll just finish up with a story about uh, a very short story. Me and the same medic who was with me on uh, the incident where the man died, the first incident, were called to the in-processing center where they had a man who was semi-unconscious in the back of a five-ton, which is a very, very big truck. And uh, he was restrained with his hands cuffed behind his back and his feet cuffed and... Uh, he was also blindfolded, and the sergeant in charge asked me if I felt as though he could walk the approximate 15 feet to the doorway, and I revived him, and I said he could probably walk with assistance to the doorway, and he then proceeded 
to pick the blindfolded man up by the flexi cuffs, throw him off the back of the Humvee, face down, chest down, in the gravel, and say, you can't spell abuse without Abu. That's all I have.